Um, this is the abbreviated title for my talk. Um, I'm going to talk about our attempts to understand and um, implement the design of sustainability. And um, I think another premise of my talk is that we can use biology to make useful things. We're only getting started at this, but we have a long his we do have a history um, since the advent of molecular biology in making, for example, protein-based drugs, but tackling the problem of the environment. Um, unfortunately, we didn't start soon enough. Um, also, uh, sometimes I have to justify my work to other agencies, which are more hypothesis-driven. Um, that said, they never funded anyway. But, uh, <laughs> but, but I think that if you can design or redesign a system, this is a way to test your real understanding of the system. So we call this now synthetic biology. Um, we can debate whether uh, there's anything new here, but I think there is. And, and if nothing else, it's, it's garnering a lot of attention, especially from young people. Um, some of the things that fall under the rubric of synthetic biology um, pertain to the idea that we would like to make the engineering of biology faster and more predictable. So how are we going to get there? So one notion is that we need, uh, that DNA, of course, is the material of biology, and we need ever faster, inexpensive ways to make DNA. Um, I don't have my glasses on, but I'm looking out here, and I think there's a lot of young people. And so I like to imagine your future where instead of, oh, the PCR reaction didn't work or whatever, and maybe you don't do that here, but whatever. Um, they do it in my lab. Um, but instead, um, a future where you would sit at a computer and know enough about, say, the parts that you could then order that DNA. It wouldn't come in a month, it would come in a day, and then the experiment would start. So wouldn't that be cool? Um, so speeding up the process of designing biological systems, and to be honest, we're getting there. Um, now, thank you, G JGI. We have lots of material to work with, uh, tons of sequenced genomes every day, and thank you again. That information is easily accessible. Now, the last point um, is one that's sort of near and dear to my heart because I began in this area about 10 years ago together with a group of bioengineers and computer scientists from MIT. And we took the world view, we took the view that designing biology could be very much like de designing circuits or computer chip design. Why is that? Well, I think we now have a pretty good appreciation of the modularity of biology. Um, we could argue how modular it really is. We used to think that the gene was the modular unit of biology, but we now know that the gene is formed from promoters, et cetera. Proteins are highly modular. We know that we can cut and paste many of these things together. We don't necessarily know the rules for doing it, and that's what we would like to learn. We also understand, as systems biologists, a lot more about the kinds of logic that is used by biology. And it's, in many ways, not that dissimilar from circuit logic. There are, there are AND gates, there are positive and negative feedback play a big role in biological design. Um, also important to this endeavor of engineering biology, sensing orthogonality, building systems that can sit within a cell and not interact with the cell, um, concepts of actuation and transmission. Now, this is from a review that I think just came out yesterday in Cell, and the issue is about systems biology, but I was asked, together with Christina Smolke, to talk about some of the challenges and synergies between systems biology and synthetic biology. And I want to point out the two that I think are relevant to this audience. Um, first of all, the importance of diverse data sets. And this is where we get our parts to make biological systems. So again, keep it up here. Um, 
And secondly, the increased diversity of parts. So this allows us, this is where we synergize um, and this gives us yet more tools to design ever yet more complex systems. Okay, so here's what I'm going to talk about. Um, briefly, I'm going to talk about our efforts to optimize carbon fixation. I'm going to talk about our efforts to use sunlight to make stuff. And then for your entertainment, I'm going to talk about our attempts to make photosynthetic animals. Um, so if you don't like the rest, stay tuned for the end. Okay, the sun. So, so sunlight is probably our, our greatest natural resource. Um, and of course, uh, the reduction in oxidation of carbon is central to life on Earth. Now, there are two strategies uh, for using photosynthesis. And the one that I saw a lot of posters about last night, of course, is the use of plants. We just heard a very nice talk about that. But being uh, more of the persuasion of working on single cell organisms, we have decided to use photosynthetic bacteria. Um, they're highly tractable. They offer a single organism solution to, to photosynthesis. Okay, so I'm going to forget the plant-based systems for now. Sorry. Um, okay, so in doing this, in, in working on cyanobacteria, it's important to remember also that there's some, there's still, it's not just about design. We can't just say, okay, we're going to go to the moon. Um, we don't know enough yet. We actually still have to learn some biology. Um, and one thing about cyanobacteria is that they are responsible for nearly 50% of the photosynthesis that goes on on Earth. So understanding their biology, even if we never engineer them successfully, is an important endeavor. And I will tell you a little bit of some biology that we learned. But let me go back to the sun. Um, so, so as I said, um, solar power, however you harvest it, is potentially sustainable. So on the Earth, the solar power total hitting the Earth is about 100,000 terawatts, and currently the worldwide power usage is only about 15. So, so we, we've got a lot to work with. We've got some problems. We have no way of doing this cheaply, um, and we know ha have, don't have good ways of doing this efficiently to reduce land use. Um, obviously, these are concerns that we're all working on. Now. Um, some call what we do in synthetic biology, how is it any different from metabolic engineering? And I think um, we like to call it meta-metabolic engineering, sort of, or metabolic engineering on steroids. So in, in our wildest dreams, imagine if we could have an organism that could fix CO2, and depending on how you program it, it could make different things. It could make fuels, it could make hydrogen, it can make other things. So, so that's really our way, our, our thinking is to have one universal organism that could do a lot of these things. Okay, so let me talk about carbon fixation. So in cyanobacteria, um, interestingly, they, they compartmentalize carbon fixation into these structures. These are highly structured units. They're completely protein-based, um, and they house rubisco and the, um, enzy and the enzymatic machinery needed to fix carbon. Uh, you can also see the double membrane, uh, the thylakoid-like membrane around the, the cyanobacteria, and remember this for later. Um, it looks like a chloroplast, um, and it is, in fact, probably the precursor of one. So I had a, a we were curious about these carboxysomes, and I had a very talented um, undergraduate student who decided to see if we could visualize them in living cells. This is something we do a lot in my laboratory. So we fused the green fluorescent protein to some of the components of the carboxysome. And I hope you can see this if you're not red, green, green colorblind. Um, can you see that in the back? Can, yes? OK, good. Um, OK, so what you're looking at here, the red, is the natural fluorescence uh, from the photosystem, and the green are the labeled carboxysomes. So this was the first view of carboxysomes in living cells. Um, and as I said, they house Rubisco. Um, there are a lot of hypotheses for why the cells do this. One is that this, this process of carbon fixation is inherently 
um, sensitive to oxygen, and this may be a way of protecting the, the reactions from, from um, oxygen. And as most of you probably know, Rubisco, albeit the most abundant enzyme on Earth, is actually one of the least efficient. Um, and this is a large complex. It's part, it has been solved to, I think, about 12 angstroms resolution. Now, what we did also was to develop a system to watch carboxysomes over many days under a, micros under a microscope. We could watch cyanobacteria grow. Um, and this was no small effort. We had to build this system here where we could control the light. Um, and I'm just going to play you a little movie of what they look like as they grow. Um, it's kind of pretty. And we also learned from observing them that the spacing between the carboxysomes remains constant as the cells grow, and there's conservative replication. So when the cell divides, it gets an equal number of carboxysomes. So that got us to thinking about how we could use that fact to understand and control carbon fixation. And I'm not going to go into great depth about this, but we, we identified genes that were responsible for the proper segregation of carboxysomes. And then when we delete these genes, as I said, this is a very tractable organism, and I'm just going to play you a few movies, and if you watch where the red arrow is, every now and then you get a cell that gets no carboxysomes, and it has very slow growth until it starts to reform carboxysomes. So this tells us that the cells need the carboxysome in order to grow. Um, and moreover, we can sort them into two populations, those that have a few and those that have a lot, and we can distinguish their level of carbon fixation depending on how many carboxysomes they have. Okay, so that's the carboxysome. It's pretty cool. Um, so we wondered, and, and this will become relevant in a moment when I talk about the ARPA-E project, um, whether or not we could assemble carboxysomes in organisms that don't normally fix carbon as a way of getting to a point where, as I said, we could transfer carbon fixation from one organism to another. And we were able to do that. We took an operon that encodes all the proteins of the carboxysome, expressed it in E. coli, and we see these structures that look like carboxysomes and, in fact, will fix carbon. You have to do a few tricks to get that to happen. All right, so what can we do with this fixed carbon? So let me tell you about the ARPA-E. Um, so we're, the, as most of you know, ARPA-E um, is, is one of the few agencies that is sort of a, has blue sky projects that they will fund. Now this one is really blue sky, um, but, but I've come to love it. Um, okay, so the idea is to create living electrochemical catalysts. Um, and this is not cyanobacteria, but the idea is that it's a different way to use light or any other kind of energy that could get around some of the associated problems with something like cyanobacteria where you may require open pond farming and the such. Um, and so the idea also was to take advantage of other kinds of bacteria that have been ignored in the engineering community. Um, in particular, in this case, electrophilic bacteria. Um, so the idea is to provide a current to these bacteria. It could come from anywhere. It could come from solar panels. It could come from wind. Um, the cells would have to fix carbon. And because it's funded by the DOE, um, they have to be able to make a transportation-compatible fuel. My vision is instead to make this a universal chassis so that they would make lots of things. So if we never get to the fuel, that, I guess that's okay. But we have to, we'll still have to get to the fuel. <laughs> so so um, we have a little, um, RPE really likes us to do lots of presentations. So we have a little thingy here, which is electron uptake, carbon fixation. And the fuel we're making, by the way, is octanol, so we call this eco. Um, we chose octanol um, because it actually is quite an ideal fuel. I should say most of the other teams chose butanol. We are the only team um, not working on butanol, in fact, which is sort of interesting. Um, now, I just want to mention something, and, 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 and again, this is something that comes out of 
these genome sequences. So we've got to fix, one of the ideas is either to use an organism that already fixes carbon or to transfer carbon fixation into the organism. So it now turns out that at last read, I could be wrong, there are at least six ways now published to fix carbon. So it's not all about the Calvin cycle. And this is one pathway um, that we're quite interested in, the 3-hydroxypropionate pathway, because there is no known oxygen sensitivity in this pathway. So what we've done actually is to synthesize all the genes in this pathway, it turns out to be fairly complex, and to insert them into E. coli. E. coli is kind of our test bed organism. And it's pretty exciting because um, we actually have two-thirds of the pathway working in E. coli just from that exercise, and it only took us a couple months to do that. So, um, so we're thinking about other ways to fix carbon, and I, I look at all of your slides about sequencing, and I, I'm always looking for carbon fixation pathways. Um, this is an example of a small scale, um, very small scale microbial fuel cell. This lists some of the, organ some of the kinds of bacteria that we're testing. Um, this is obviously a, a prototype. Um, when the 60 Minutes people came to do a, ARP, a story on RPE, she took one look at this and I think she said, oh, this is never going to save the world. So we never made it onto 60 Minutes. Can't blame her. Um, we also had a little bit of a problem. RPE had a, a, a big uh, festival in Washington. We had a little problem getting it on the plane. Um, <laughs> So anyway, it works. We can we can get we can build a small scale apparatus that will um, transfer current to these bacteria. Okay, um, how much time do I have left? Five or ten minutes. Okay. Um, okay. So so I also had this dream of um, hydrogen. <laughs> and this started several years ago because in my we're just plain vanilla research lab, getting into synthetic biology. We were interested in um, doing something in bioenergy. Uh, little did we know that we would get involved in RPE, um, but we decided to take on a, a long-term challenge, um, and that was biohydrogen. I, am, I think at best there will be a hydrogen economy in 20 years, although BMW is totally committed to a hydrogen-based car, so there. Um, and I want the first one. Um, but hydrogen presents some interesting challenges, and we thought that um, we would also learn a lot of interesting things by doing this. And also, of course, hydrogen is a potentially valuable high energy density fuel and no carbon emissions. So you can, so hydrogen is produced from enzymes called hydrogenases. Um, you can express them in different micro, microorganisms, and they will produce hydrogen, as illustrated here. Um, but there's a couple, pro there are a lot of problems. Uh, one is that the hydrogenases are inherently oxygen sensitive. Um, and, but what, and the other thing is that they use, they transfer electrons from ferrodoxins to the hydrogenase. Our vision was to someday couple this to the photosynthetic machinery so that we could make a, an organism that would produce hydrogen in response to photosynthesis. But what I'm going to do here is just illustrate um, some of the lessons we've learned and, and the approaches we've taken and some very exciting new data. So, so the problem, as I said, is oxygen sensitivity and also competition. This is, gets to this issue of orthogonality, competition within the organism for electrons. Okay, so we've got these two problems, and I'm not going to talk about um, how we got around the oxygen sensitivity. Suffice it to say, we, we use genetic selections, but I'm just going to illustrate how we create, we insulate a pathway from the rest of the organism. Um, so there are a couple of ways. One is to delete competing reactions. Another is to mutate the two binding surfaces. This is in the case of the ferrodoxin and the hydrogenase, make them bind better. Another, which is one of my favorites, is to directly fuse the proteins together so they're always in contact with each other. And a third is to use, or fourth is to use a scaffold. So in the case of the hydrogenase reaction in E. coli, we compared all of these systems. And what we found in this case um, was that we could get about a four to five fold in change in hydrogen production. And in this case, the direct protein fusion worked best. 
Um, so this is a demonstration. Now, we were still intrigued by the scaffold idea, and there's a little story behind this. I had a postdoc come to my lab who came from the field of DNA nanotechnology. And I said, okay, no more smiley faces. If you can think of something to do with this that's supplied and practical, you can work on it. Um, and, uh, and I apologize to anyone if, if that was insulting, but um, <laughs> I love the smiley faces, but, um, but, but this field really needs to do something, right? And so, so he did do something with DNA, but the problem with DNA nanotechnology, unless someone here has a solution, it's not clear to me how we're going to get those structures to fold up inside cells. But what I do know a lot about folding inside of cells is RNA. So instead, what we did was we took the DNA nanotechnology um, strategies and applied them to RNA. And the general idea was to build an RNA platform that would grow inside bacteria and would then scaffold different proteins together by having the proteins would have RNA binding sites on them. OK, so we did that. And here's a proof of concept. We used a split GFP. These are the negative controls, but when we have the, the basically it works. When you bring the split GFP together, you, bring, you get fluorescent bacteria. So that was pretty exciting. So then we wondered, could we organize a biochemical reaction, such as the paradox and hydrogenase reaction, um, onto the scaffold and improve it? And it was striking. Um, the, depending on how we build the scaffold, we can get up to 50-fold increase in hydrogen biosynthesis, which I don't think anyone has seen in bacteria. So maybe there's hope for hydrogen, although I saw it was one of the main things that was going to be cut from the DOE budget, um, so, so much for that. Um, okay, so instead, um, let's make something else. So, so fuel, as you probably all know, depending on the economics of the day, uh, the, at least in the U.S., the, the markup on fuel is not very great. So, um, so you've got to make a lot of it. Um, this may change, but it's a problem if we're making biofuels. One concept that we had was an economic one was instead start with something that has high value and let that train you in how to build the system. So, for example, if we take our cyanobacteria and get them to make a high-value commodity, we don't have to grow something the size of the state of New York in order to make money from it. And then we could then use profits from that to go into figuring out how to grow them in, you know, the state, huge amounts that you need. So, um, basic idea, fix CO2. These are autotrophs. They, they need a few minerals and, and sunlight. Um, and so we decided to get them to make sugar. Um, so the basic strategy is uh, under certain conditions, they will produce sucrose. And then we insert an enzyme that cleaves the sucrose. And we, they don't transport things out. So we have to introduce a transporter to get them to secrete the fructose and the glucose. And I'm not going to go into all the data, but here's a nice example of how this works. Um, this big green glob here is E. coli. The red are the cyanobacteria. The E. coli require um, glucose as a carbon source. There is no carbon source being provided for them on this plate except for what's being secreted from the cyanobacteria. So it's, in essence, we built a little system where the E. coli are now dependent on light to grow. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up um, with the more phantasmagorical part. Uh, so I was intrigued by the fact that we had made these cyanobacteria that could secrete sugar. And so in some ways, they reminded me of chloroplasts. Um, and so there are cases of naturally occurring photosynthetic animals. I particularly like this sea slug. Some of you here may study it. Um, it actually takes up genes uh, from the plant chloroplasts into its own genome um, and, and these various other organisms, which are all fascinating, and you should sequence them all. Um, OK, there are also synthetic photosynthetic animals. Um, <laughs> 
This is an icon familiar to all of us. Now, this would never work, right? The surface to volume ratio um, isn't going to work out. If, if, if we're going to have photosynthetic skin, we're going to have to be small. So we will be small green people. So when we get to Mars, we'll fit in, right? Um, okay, so we didn't do that either. Um, but we, what we, so we needed an organism that was clear, and I had, um, so light could get in. So I had a neighbor who works on the zebrafish. So um, this is wacky experiment number one. One of my grad, very daring graduate students, Christina Agapakis, um, injected the cyanobacteria into the zygote of the zebrafish and the first surprise was they didn't die, um, and they actually grew into fish. Um, and every one of these red dots represents a cyanobacteria inside the fish. Let me just say as an aside, if you do this same experiment with E. coli, the zygotes blow up. So, there's, so as an aside, there's something interesting about these autotrophs that maybe we should be, when we think about therapeutic bacteria, we might be thinking in the wrong direction. Now here's a little movie. Um, you can see the cyanobacteria in the beating heart, and here are the fish developing, and every one of those red dots is a cyanobacteria. I wish I could tell you that I could shine light on these fish and they didn't need any food. That's not the case. And any one of you must realize that only one of these per cell is not going to be enough. Um, we estimate that you would probably need about 100, and also glucose is probably not the best choice. Um, we should probably make something that's more limiting to the cells. Okay, so that's our progress on the photosynthetic fish. Um, and so lastly, uh, we decided to see what happens if you put them in mammalian cells. Uh, so we engineered them uh, with, these en with these proteins so that they would be taken up by macrophages. And I'm just going to replay this movie um, because we can actually see one of them divide in the macrophage. So here's, here it's, it's going to actually divide inside the macrophage. So, so this is pretty interesting. Um, you can put cyanobacteria inside mammalian cells and they don't kill the cells and they will actually divide. So, so obviously this needs about 100 steps to make it better, but maybe someday we'll be going to space and having photosynthetic skin. So I'll just end on that. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for Pam? Uh, are the Neapolitanus carboxysomes functional in E. coli? I'm sorry, the what? Are the Neapolitanus carboxysomes that you express in yes. E. coli functional? Yes, um, to the extent that in a couple ways. One, we can isolate them and they're functional. They will, they will um, fix carbon at the extent of rubisco. And also the bacteria themselves will fix carbon. We have some very preliminary data on whether that fixed carbon actually gets into the uh, biosynthetic pathway. So that would be the ultimate goal there. Um, we don't know that yet. By the way, it's, it's already known that you can express Rubisco in bacteria. So, so this, the question is, is this somehow more efficient? Yes. Yes. Um, you talked about sustainability, and I wondered about um, nitrogen sustainability. Are any of your systems uh, nitrogen fixing? No. Okay. We've sort of stayed away from that mm -hmm. because um, I think there are a lot of really good people working on it, but we might eventually have to delve into that. So you need that. To, to fix nitrogen and provide yeah. it to your organisms. Yeah. 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 Nitrogenase um, produces hydrogen as a byproduct, uh, yeah. so you might get yeah. uh, double bang for your buck if you can work with that. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have a question. The idea of using RNA as a scaffolding structure is really brilliant because you can both amplify it and presumably tune it. Have you, um, can you imagine putting multiple scaffolds in and being able to yeah. start so, to play, play that game yet? Right. So, so I didn't go into a lot of detail. What those are, that's not just a single RNA folded up. 
as I said, it's analogous to DNA nanotechnology. So those are actually tiled arrays inside the cells. So if you do AFM on the cells, you can see these incredible one and two or two and three D dimensional structures, and they are highly organized. And so the answer is yes. I think this thing can blow up to multiple things organized on it, and you can also program it because you could imagine chasing things off with. Um, you know, oligon or small RNAs that would hybridize and chase things off. So, so I think this is a beginning of a really cool thing, and it, it was ama I was amazed it worked. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, well, we'll move on. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you.